David Bizard here, and you are watching Paratech 10. Our goal is to try and present to you guys tech that is reliable, tech that you may overlook or not understand the knock-on implications of. In other words, we're trying to educate you to a deeper level of understanding for your performance needs. In this episode, which I believe will be episode 89, I am going to deal with something that is less than obvious. I know this must be so because I see so many people making the same mistake. The subject is going to be ram pipes. And I'm going to explain to you why one of the most popular ram stacks on the market is close to useless. I'm sure you've all seen those ram stacks with the five inch hole at the bottom that bell out like this. Oh, they look super trick. And you know, on the flow bench, they do absolutely nothing for the flow. Now that doesn't mean that they're not useful, but not for the reason you may think. Now, let me tell you a little story here. Now, back in about 1973, I was part of a team called Cheltenham Autosports Team. Basically, I was the engineer in the group. Not to say that some of the other guys weren't good engineers. In fact, as near as I can remember, pretty much every one of us in the team was in engineering in some form or other. One of the cars the team ran was a Formula Ford. Now, Pete, and I can't remember his last name, brain surgery, but I worked with him for probably 10 years, so it's not like I haven't forgotten him. Pete had this Formula Ford, and basically he bought it as a really worn out deal and rebuilt the entire car. Now, Pete had a fairly decent budget, but it was far from as much as was needed to run a Formula Ford. So I built the engine for him and we only had an opportunity to build one engine for the season. Now, one of the things that Formula Fords did in those days, this is when they ran a 1600cc uh, pushrod crossflow engine. Same was in the 1600cc Pinto, right? But it was a Kent engine made in England. Now, pretty much every one of those um, Formula Fords that he was competing against was running the carburetor straight to open air. And I think the carburetor was something like a, a 2832 whatever. It's a two barrel car progressive carburetor. Good carburetor, but it was one made specially for Ford for this engine. Now, one of the things that uh, we did was um, put an air filter on it. Now, the reason I wanted to run an air filter is I suspected, or I knew, I couldn't, I can't remember what it was at that particular time, that the booster would suffer a highly turbulent airflow uh, around the um, uh, top of the carburetor. So the signal that was given to draw the fuel would fluctuate very rapidly and it different angles would cause it to do different things. In other words, if you were cornering on a fast corner or going straight, there'd be a different deal going on. And I named this at the time booster buffering. Now, I reasoned that if we put a k and filter on, the reason I picked a K&N filter was because they were one of the most efficient ones there. If we put a k and filter on, we could kill that booster buffing, buffeting and have the engine run as if it was more or less in still air, right? So 
we would more closely achieve the results seen on the dyno. Now, notice I said more closely, not perfectly. You can still get booster buffering on the dyno. This is why sometimes, sometimes, you can take off the airflow measuring stuff and this especially applies if it hasn't got straighteners in it, airflow straighteners. Put on a k &M filter and see more horsepower. Take that k &M filter off and see less horsepower. That's with nothing on the carburetor. But fans are blowing air down and across and all this sort of stuff. right? So Anyway, remembering that situation brought to mind this story about booster buffeting. Now, what I told everybody else when they saw me running a filter on the engine, I said, well, we know we're going to take a power hit, but the engine won't wear out. And I can't afford to build Pete another engine this year. So that one's got to last him all year. Right. So they accepted that blind faith. And you know what? That was the opinion of most engine builders. In fact, it was an opinion which held good with some engine builders right up until maybe the early 90s. I had one very well-known carburetor guy say to me, and I quote, we all know filters cost you horsepower. No, we don't. The wrong filter will cost you horsepower. The right filter won't. Now, let's get back onto our main story here. And that is my claim that the mo one of the most popular Ram stacks is also definitely the worst. But does it make it go slower or faster? Well, the one I'm talking about, like I said, is that big bell mouth one I think I'll find a photograph of it and stick it in the corner somewhere but here's what happens no flow increase when you stick one of these on a holly many years ago I did some um, dyno runs on several engines with several different sizes of carburetors before and after tests revealed virtually no change in horsepower as for on the track, that was a slightly different story. These tall ram stacks may have failed on the flow bench, but on the racetrack, the car went faster. And one of the things that also prompted this is I happened to come across the test figures. And the car went 11.23 11 11 with the bell mouth on. And this was an average of about four runs. And with it off, it went 11.44.21 seconds slower. And a mile an hour was down. Can't remember what the mile an hour was. Anyway, that was with no hood on the engine. Now, after that, we put a filter on an enormous paper filter. Why? Because we had one. And the car went faster yet. Right? 11.20 with the filter on. Now there's a paper one. I know it flowed a lot of air because it was about yay high and about 16 inches diameter. Now, why would that be so? Well, like I said, the booster buffering is causing a problem. Now, we did take some high-speed film of this going on. I have no idea where that film's gone. It was done with a film camera, not a digital camera. And it wasn't my camera, and it was damnably expensive. But you could see the fuel droplets go from very well atomized to lumps right and it was completely random that was when you were blowing air over the top of the carburetor when you took that airflow away and just let the carburetor draw from still air it tidied up the 
discharge of the fuel much uh, to a much greater extent. Now, how do we get? How do we know what works for a ram stack on a carburetor? Well, to be honest, almost none of them work, except the K and N stub stacks. How do I know they worked? I designed those personally for K and N in lieu of the fact that most of the ram stacks out there didn't do a darn thing. Right? So what I proposed to K and N was making a ram stack that out of plastic that plugged right on to the carburetor itself. And the idea was that if we made it out of a urethane, which was at that point in time a coming technology, now that's that's overstating it, a coming um, uh, it was coming of age. And typically these stub stacks as I call them because they're just a stub like this which fit right over the choke and everything on a regular car router would up, seriously up the airflow and um, uh, let me think of one that comes to mind here 750 vacuum secondary carburetor you put one of these on and it was pretty much exactly 25 CFM up so it went from 750 to 775 and the signal improved. Anyway, tested it on the dyno, and in most occasions it was worth, on say a 400 horsepower engine, it was typically worth seven to eight horsepower. Now let's say that you want to install one of those big stacks. You can. Be sure you put a filter on top of it, and you cut down the outside of a K&N stub stack until it just fits into the carburetor at the bottom and comes up to the edge of the big stack. What's happening here is the big stack does nothing to streamline the air entry into the uh, barrels of the carburetor. Nothing. Right, all those rough edges are still there. On the other hand, the stub stack rounds everything off, so it guides it in. Hence the fact that it works. Now, if you put one of those into the um, uh, the big tall stack, fitted inside, then you put an air filter on top. You will virtually eliminate the booster buffeting. And you'll pick up airflow. Now, again, I looked up the figures of some tests I did. Maybe about 98, 99-ish. Um, we ran a Camaro. Say we, it wasn't mine. Can't remember whose it was now. But we tested a Camaro, which had a small block Chevy on it. Um, about 550 horsepower on, on my dyno and the um, and it it ran about 10.18 can't find a piece of paper i wrote this down yeah i'm pretty sure it's about 10.18 and i remember afterwards the um, car ran a 9.88 now, with a car that's going that fast, that's a pretty good reduction. And it had never run in the nines before. So, taking care of how the air enters the carburetor and how uh, smoothly it is. Now, it's always going to be turbulent. And somebody that tells you, well, I streamlined all this so it had laminar flow. Trust me, you have no idea what they're talking about. You cannot get laminar flow in a carburetor. It is always turbulent. The Reynolds number exceeds 2000 and therefore the flow will be turbulent. It's going to be turbulent in the ports, whether you like it or not. And throughout the system, you cannot have laminar flow 
within the induction system of a car unless you've got a ram stack that's three feet in diameter and the air is going about one mile an hour maybe less than that so what we're doing is we're going to orientate the air so that it has the least turbulence that is varying all over the place if we have microscopic turbulence then the airflow through the carburetor will for all practical purposes seem pretty steady it's that buffeting that it doesn't like so that's what you have to get rid of that should give you a guide as to how to set up your carburetion right an open carburetor sticking out in the breeze is not the way to do it ramming air into the carburetor carte blanche without making modifications to ram the bowls as well to equalize the pressure will not work you will go slower so pay attention to how the air goes into your carburetor and if somebody says well i took the air filter off because i wanted it to go faster don't inform them any different if they're competing against you leave them be and say well i can't afford to do that i want my engine to last and run a can and filter now if you look at the can and catalog you will see that somewhere in the back it's got all the calculations you need to figure out what filter is the right size for your engine so that it doesn't lose power right i know those figures are accurate i did them for knn right so that's my advice on carburation the next video i'm going to do on carburation which will probably follow this one is a uh is about a, a modification or a system addition, a fuel system addition, which always works 100% of the time. And yet 90% of the people who do this modification go slower. And I'm going to tell you what that is. So be ready to tune in to episode 90. Thank you all for watching.